Welcome you all to the 20th lecture in the Democracy Dialogue series. We are extremely thankful uh, and spending her time. And you'll be, you'll be knowing that last time also she was there with us and she dis discussed about uh, voices of dissent in, uh, in ancient India. So this evening, she will be enlightening us about our history, their history, and whose history. I, I invite Professor Thapar uh, to share her views. So Mr. Thapar. Thank you very much indeed. And may I begin by expressing my thanks to Democracy Dialogues for <clears throat> this invitation to speak. They've certainly had some very exciting lectures and speakers in the past. Um, the highly respected historian of modern Europe, Eric Hobsbawm, was asked about the relationship of history to nationalism. He replied that history is to nationalism what a poppy is to heroin addiction. History is essential to the theory that the origins of nationalism lie in the ancient past. This idea is then used to legitimize the current ideology of nationalism whichever one it may be. Further, that the produce of the poppy conjures up in the mind of the heroin ad addict many fantasies about a magnificent past to which the addict wishes to return. Those of you who are familiar with the countercurrents of what is called history in India today, or indeed those of you that have smoked pot, might appreciate the parallel. In societies that have been colonies of European empires, a second influential facet in the explanation of history is the reconstruction of history by colonial scholars. This reconstruction facilitated the colonial understanding of the past of the colony. Since it dates to the beginnings of the colonial relationship, it has many flaws, but is nevertheless taken as accurate today. This in part explains why the construction of Indian history, and more particularly, the history of the second millennium AD has taken the shape that it has. It is dependent on both the theories of nationalism and on colonial readings of Indian history. This also explains why, in large part, the decolonizing of Indian history that has been going on since India became independent has been a challenge to earlier narratives of history and to those who endorse these views. The challenge has coincided with the shift in professional history, which is now a part of the social sciences. In India, it is no longer treated as Indology. It therefore uses a methodology which results in a more accurate history and different from what the colonial scholars reconstructed. I shall speak this evening about why history comes to the forefront in current times, together with the prevalence of religious nationalism and colonial ideas. Cultures like ours that have existed for many centuries have a history of being punctuated by major historical changes transforming the society. These are not arbitrary. The logic of their forms comes from their earlier forms and context. Nationalism that should carry the entire population of citizens introduces the change with multiple requirements that make for a new society. The polity mutates from kingdoms and colonies of earlier times into independent nation states characterized 
primarily by democracy and secularism if they are to succeed as nation states. If every person has equal status and equal rights as a citizen in a nation state, then democracy and secularism inevitably follow. In a proper nation state, people are no longer subjects of a kingdom or a ruler, but are free citizens of the state and of equal status. Governing the state is dependent on the wishes of the people. Power lies not with those that govern, but with the agencies that represent the citizens, such as the judiciary, the legislature, the executive. The rules of government are not the arbitrary wishes of the ruler, as in a kingdom, but the actions based on constitutional authority. The dominant nationalism may be singular and a force for uniting all citizens, but there can also be subsidiary nationalisms drawing on religious, linguistic, ethnic, or other identities. These are not intended to unify all the citizens, but to segregate them according to a particular identity. Where one of these is dominant, it could overthrow the integrated nationalism. Therefore, the question has been asked as to whether these latter segregated nationalisms can be called nationalism at all. Segregation means that primary status is given to that community which has the majority. There is recourse to history to try and prove the antiquity of these segregated identities and thereby their legitimacy. There develops a difference or even a confrontation between the professional historian using a historical method and the popularizer garnering public support by rewriting history, whether accurately or not. But in order to justify a particular kind of nation state, one that gives centrality to a particular identity. This is not confined to the Indian experience alone. It can be recognized in other post-colonial societies as well, all trying to redefine nationalism. In previous times, the study and writing of history in various forms was left to scholars. But today, the past has been politicized by being drawn into the political requirements of present times. There was an element of this in earlier historical writing, but today it has taken over as the major interest in some kinds of historical writing. Therefore, history has become the domain of everyone and anyone who chooses to refer to something that he or she may call history. There has now emerged a category of people who have little or no understanding of the discipline of history and no methodological training, but who, all the same, pronounce upon the past with full confidence, basing themselves either on hearsay or their own imagination. What they say generally has little connection with factual history. There is no shortage of public figures and politicians who confidently make statements about the past, despite their having no knowledge of the subject. History, as with many other subjects, has now become a specialized discipline with its own rules and methodology. The public figure treats history as just a story. It could be a story that I narrate or you narrate or anybody else for that matter. Making up stories is great fun and very entertaining, 
as we all know from having done so for years. But when these stories are claimed as factual, then they have to be proved. They cannot be part of entertainment, especially when they become central to the most influential of current storytellers, namely the media of every kind. History is not just a narrative of what happened in the past, even if the narrative is factual. We have to explain what happened and how and why it happened. This explanation has to draw on reliable evidence, logical and rational causal connections and statements about the past have to be based on as much proof as possible. There is no catechism in history. In India, as in some countries elsewhere too, democracy has been reduced to a slogan. The debate on democracy the world over has a history and almost every culture claims itself as the inventor. However, democracy is tied to nationalism and both are recent events on the historical time scale. One of the major interests among historians of India these days is the recognition that history was first written in the form in which we know it, that it is written by colonial scholars. This history is being analyzed and assessed by historians today and is discarded where evidence is lacking. More frequently, Indian non-historians pick up the themes of colonial history and try to pass them off as indigenous Indian history, which of course they are not. They dismiss the views of those historians that challenge the theories of colonial writing by labeling them as Marxists and leftists, terms used as abuse. This situation is at one level entertaining for the professional historian, but at another level, simply contentious and rather meaningless as an argument. History became a major interest with the arrival of the colonial power the British. For them, history as they knew it was the key to understanding a society. We're talking about the 18th century. They had to try and understand the colony they were ruling. So they asked for the histories of India, failed to recognize them, and insisted that they did not exist. This was convenient as it meant that the colonial authority could now construct their version of a history of India and one that would be useful to them in giving a direction to Indian politics. The past of the Indian colony thus constructed would enable the colonial power to govern the colony in the way they wanted to. At the same time, it provided legitimacy from a version that they themselves had constructed. Every early efforts at drawing political legitimacy from history were well aware of how effective such legitimacy was. And more so when a new ideology was being introduced as happened with the arrival of colonial rule. Colonial historical scholarship had two goals. Both were to be deeply influential in providing the basic orientation to the Indian past. One was to discover a new culture, distinctly different from the European, and then explain how it functioned. This scholarship of discovery began in the 18th century. William Jones, working in the judiciary at Calcutta, studied the Vedas and posited connections between Sanskrit, Greek, and Persian. 
Other discoverers were James Sprinsett, who decided the Brahmi script, and Alexander Cunningham, who used archaeological evidence to reveal the past. Colonial officers working in India were enthusiastic about these activities, as also were the Indian officials for whom all this material was new. Two of the influential persons among these writers worked in England with jobs connected to India, but both refused to visit India and meet Indian scholars. They wrote in part from their own reading of the texts without using any methods of analysis. These two were James Mill and Frederick Max Mueller. Mill wrote the first modern history of India, the history of British India, starting in 1817, the book starting in 1817. Much of it was based on what he envisaged the history might have been, and was therefore completely different from what had been written earlier in Indian language sources. His major argument was that the history of India, and this is crucial to our as understanding of the present conflict between historians and non-historians. His major argument was that the history of India consisted of the history of two nations, the Hindu nation and the Muslim nation, quite distinctly separate and constantly and permanently in conflict. This periodized Indian history into the earliest Hindu period when Hinduism was powerful, then came the Muslim period when Islamic rulers dominated, and finally came the British who controlled events in the third period. This initial periodization lasted over two centuries and deeply colored the interpretation of Indian history. It was discarded by professional historians of the last half century who found that its single and universally applied explanation that religion was the prime cause of every activity was quite untenable. What were the implications of this kind of history? The periodization was sharply defined as distinctively different with virtually no overlap. Sorry. The Hindu period was a version of what was said to, in the early Sanskrit texts. The Muslim period was described from the information given in the Persian and Turkish chronicles of the Sultanate and the Mughal courts. And this history of the Persian chronicles began with the invasion of Sindh by the Arabs and the raids of Mahmud of Ghazni. These records were largely claims to victorious raids and invasions, every confrontation invariably claiming the death of 50,000 infidels. This was a kind of matter of fact figure that was thrown up each time. Hindu temples, it was said, were the target of attack, although historians have count, counted only about 80 temples that may have been touched. In West Asia, conversion to Islam was highly successful, but this was not so in South Asia or in East Asia. This failure of Islam to convert the massive population it was said by the opponents of Islam, was counterbalanced by victimizing those that did not convert, in effect, the majority of the population. The argument being that whereas in West Asia, the population did not have to be victimized because they converted, in the case of South Asia, they had to be victimized because they didn't convert. Such sources tended to be taken literally before the techniques of critical inquiry so essential to historical methodology came into practice. 
It was recognized as an attempt to simplify everything to one single cause, religious difference. Other causes that go into the making of human activity were ignored. It was a travesty of the way serious history was being written when this kind of history is compared to the careful in inquiries that were being made by European historians into European history. Let me give you one example. Much of European thinking, although not all, put the study of Asia into a mold which it labeled Oriental despotism. Asian societies were projected as static and without history. The cultural pattern was like a pyramid with a highly despotic ruler at the peak controlling all resources. This he did through his administration, his subordinates and others that formed the middle level. They functioned by appropriating the income from those that labored to produce the wealth. And these latter were the persons at the base of the structure who had no rights and were generally overwhelmed by poverty. This view continued unchanged as the picture of the Indian past through the last two centuries. Major thinkers of the 19th century, Karl Marx and Max Weber, for instance, never quite shook off these approaches to Asian societies. Karl Marx labeled it as the Asiatic mode of production that barely differed from Oriental despotism. Max Weber, in studying Indian religion, focused on Hinduism and was hesitant in asking the kinds of questions that he put to the European sources when studying the history of Europe and the history of Christianity. In contrast, European history was carefully investigated with an evolving history, changing from one pattern to another. In the perception of Marx, for instance, In the perception of Marx, for instance, the society of a primitive communism gave way to more meticulously studied successive periods of slave societies, feudalism, capitalism, with the ultimate aim of communism. European social scientists generally, with some notable exceptions, when they tested various theories explaining the functioning of their societies, examined the history in depth. This they refrained from doing when investigating Asian societies, maintaining that Asian societies were all static. The noticeable change in this thinking began in the later 20th century when a number of scholars started examining Asian data all over again and discovering a succession of changes. And this led to the discarding of the colonial theories. Mill's obsession with the contesting Hindu and Muslim nations constituting Indian history had a deep influence on historical interpretation and on politics in India. It took shape as the two-nation theory that became a central feature of the colonial projection of the past, uh, of the future. Having been, having been deeply ingrained into Indian history when nations began to be envisaged, it was assumed that there would be two nations emerging in India, as stated by Mill. This in turn required religious nationalism <clears throat> to give it legitimacy. Religious nationalism became the segregated nationalism in opposition to the anti-colonial unitary nationalism in which the wider population participated. Thus, in the 1920s, Indians saw, apart from the strong 
secular democratic nationalism of the Indian National Congress, leading the movement for independence, the shape of the two religious nationalisms, Islamic and Hindu, as historically inevitable. They were written into the past of India, according to Mill. The Islamic cult culminated in Pakistan, and the Hindu is anxiously waiting to declare its India a Hindu Rasht. The rise of these two religious nationalisms obviously drew strength from colonial support and suited colonial policy. This was very different from colonial hostility to the unitary anti-colonial nationalism. From the historical perspective, we may well ask how legitimate was this as an explanation for describing the Indian past? Can we really say that the theory of the two hostile nations rooted in India, forming the bedrock of Indian history, is irrefutable? It has been taken up with much gusto by those supporting what Hindutva calls history. Let me illustrate this with one of the claims they make, namely that given the hostility between Hindus and Muslims, when the Muslims came to power, they victimized the Hindus mercilessly. However, the history that historians have researched reads differently from this theory. The victimization of a community means that it is segregated and ghettoized. It has little access to social activity. Professional activity is reduced to a minimum, if not discontinued. And there is no intermarriage with or employment given to such a community. It is kept at the lowest social rung and in the Indian situation, those victimized are not even to be touched. The whole argument about untouchability. Upper caste Hindus are very familiar with the process since they have for centuries kept the Dalits and untouchables segregated. In the data from a range of sources relating to the time of the Sultanates and the Mughals, the picture is hardly that of the victimization of any group of people, Hindu or otherwise. The dictionary tells us that to victimize is to make a victim of a person or a specific group of people that uh, to, in order to cheat swindle and defraud them, or to deny them any freedom, or to put a particular group in society to death in the manner of a sacrificial victim, that is, to slaughter them. It is commonly declared these days, especially by politicians at the highest level of authority and others, that the Muslims, <clears throat> the Muslims in medieval times victimized the Hindus. The implied inference of this statement is to justify the need today for Hindus to take revenge and victimize the Muslims. It is said that temples were destroyed, that Hindus were forcibly converted to Islam, and particularly Hindu women were forced to convert and marry Muslims. We constantly hear about the thousand years of Hindu slavery that ended with Indian independence. Moving away from Mill's mythology of Hindus and Muslims permanently hating each other, Let's just look at what were their actual relations. How did Hindus perceive themselves as described in Sanskrit and regional language sources in situations where they were in constant contact with Muslims who were in authority? 
at the highest social level were the royal families that constituted dynasties. They present an interesting admixture. Let's take into marriage. Some of the rulers were strict in marrying into only the families that were permitted to marry. But there were others in society of a recognizable number who happily married outside the caste and kinship rules, and often where such marriages were politically very useful. Traders from Arabia and East Africa who came to trade with the west coast of India go back many centuries, even before the birth of Islam itself. The trade was extensive and touched what might be called the Indian Ocean Arc. The coastline that went continuously from East Africa up the coast of Arabia onto the coast of Gujarat and then went south along coastal India to Kerala. The Arab traders who formed the largest number of migrants at this time settled in towns along this coast and these settlements flourished with the trade. The trade was extremely lucrative with Indian pepper and textiles going west via the Eastern Mediterranean and the amphorae of wine and oil arriving in India. Damal Shangam poetry, for example, is most appreciative of the wine brought by the Yavanas. This was the Sanskrit and Tamil term used for both the Greeks and the Arabs. They never refer to them as Arabs or Muslims for that matter. Major commercial centers were the ports along the Eastern Mediterranean and the Red Sea, such as Alexandria and Veronique. The trade was paid for in substantial amounts of gold and silver Roman coins, which had been found in hordes all over the peninsula. But trade was not the only outcome of these Arab settlements. Some settlers married locally as well, which is something many settlers do when they arrive in new places. When this happens, cultures intermingle. Along the west coast of India, this led to the evolution of new social and religious identities. These were a mix of Islam with existing religions in the area. This resulted in new religious sects such as the Kodas, the Bohoras, the Navayats, the Mapilas, and such like. But it also led to the employment of Arabs in local administration. The Rashtrakutas, for example, appointed Arab officers to high positions as administrators in the coastal Deccan. One of the inscriptions of the Rashtrakuta rulers records the grant of land made to a Brahman by a Yavana officer on behalf of the Rashtrakuta king. The majority of officers at this level of administration were members of the local elite and therefore largely Hindu. The participation of Hindu officers in the administration continued even in states ruled by later Muslim rulers, as is recorded in the inscriptions. Historians have not given the required attention to the data from sources such as inscriptions. The inscriptions were always treated as somehow inferior sources compared to texts. And there are many thousands of such inscriptions belonging to this period. Most of these are the official documents of governance recording factual matters, while some relate to private activities. They are therefore often more reliable than court chronicles, which were written by courtiers. And as we all know, courtiers can either be independent commentators or psychophants. Appointing local persons to high office was a practice that went back centuries in administration. It makes sense as there is control over local matters and a connect with the highest administration. 
This in part accounts for the Mughal administration, both military and civilian, appointing Rajputs to the highest positions, such as commanders of the Mughal army and the chief treasurers with immense powers. The Mughal economy, for example, was in the trusted hands of the Rajput treasurer, Todarmal. Radaman Singh of Amer, a Kachwaha Rajput, was the Rajput commander who led the Mughal army to victory at the Battle of Haldighati. He defeated the Rajput opponents of the Mughals, Maharana Pratap, a Sisodia Rajput. Pratap's army, with its large contingent of Afghan mercenaries, was also led by Hakim Khan Suri, a descendant of Sher Shah Suri. The battle, therefore, was not just a Hindu-Muslim confrontation. It was a complicated political conflict in which the two religious identities were quite mixed up. The Rajputs were split and uh, the, uh, fought, therefore, on opposite sides. Both Rana Pratap and Hakim Khan Suri were trying to regain ancestral kingdoms rather than establishing religious identities. Or so it would seem from the evidence. The intervention of the Rajputs in the politics of the Mughal court was substantial. An example of this were, was the varying Mughal relations with Bundelkhand and the Rajas of Bundelkhand and the history of its capital at Orcha. They reached a peak during the reign of Jahangir when Bir Singh Deo, the Bundela Raja, holding one of the highest mansabs, a mansab was a rank, with a rank with a revenue assignment, holding one of the highest mansabs of Mughal times. He was one among the Hindu Rajas and the other upper caste Hindus who were given mansabs to enable them to claim status and work for the administration. B. Singh Deo was so involved in Mughal politics that he participated in the assassination of the chief chronicler and close friend of Akbar, Abu Fazl, who was killed at the instigation of Jahangir when he was competing for succession. But the complexities of politics were not the only links between the Muslim rulers and the country they ruled. Marriage alliances were also recognized from early times as one of the methods of social bonding between otherwise separated communities and to strengthening minor existing bonds. Of the various sultans that ruled parts of the Indian subcontinent, Feroz Shah Tughlaq is noted for his cultural policies as well as other things. He was sensitive about knowing and trying to understand the culture and the history of India. And among other things, he investigated pre-Islamic monuments and texts and inquired into their contents. This could also have been an attempt to link the current history with the past history of pre-Sultanate times. The pillars that had been erected by Ashoka, the Mauryan king, were now lying forlorn in unforsaken places. He Ferochatoglak tried to shift a few to better locations where they would be taken care of in a concerned way. A couple of them are described as being transported with meticulous care and being placed one in the urban settlement of Delhi and another, which is still standing, commanding Ferochat's citadel in Delhi at Kotla. This latter location suggests that he saw the ancient pillar as a source of his own legitimacy to rule India.
Remember that when these objects are found, it's not just that these objects are found and you say they come from an earlier period. One has to go back and ask the question of what was the significance of the object? Why was it being taken care of in this fashion? Why was it being placed in prominent places? These follow-up questions are extremely important. The fact that he placed a pillar uh, at the top of his citadel in Delhi, um, the, the location suggests that he saw the ancient pillar as a source of his own legitimacy to rule India. He inquired from the local Brahmins as to the use of the pillars and what the inscriptions stated, because no one could read the inscriptions by then. He was given rather ridiculous explanations of what they were, as for instance, one described them as the lattes of Bhima, the, the, the staffs, the little sticks, doubtless to impress the Sultan with the physical prowess of Bhima, who being a hero of the Mahabharata, had nothing to do with the pillars. The inscriptions could no longer be read by the resident scholars. That they were gigantic, monolithic pillars and beautifully engraved deeply impressed those that wanted to know more about them. To transport them to Delhi and other places was a major enterprise in those days, because the pillars are huge. Yet Feroz Shah insisted on bringing them to his capital, both as an act of respect and a claim to dominance. Perhaps this was also occasioned in small part because his mother was a Bhatti Rajput from the Punjab. Unfortunately, the inscriptions of Ashoka, engraved almost 2,000 years earlier, could no longer be read. And although the script in which some were written was Brahmi, the ancestor of Devnagari, Indians had lost the knowledge of that script. Had this knowledge, as derived from inscriptions, been known and continued to be read, it would have added volumes to the otherwise rather sparse discussion in Sanskrit texts. Firosha Turuk was not the only Turushka, the Turkish ruler, who wanted to rediscover the ancient past. There is another pillar of Ashoka with a set of edicts that led H.G. Wells to describe Ashoka as an extraordinary and unique ruler in world history. Yet another pillar of the Mauryan king was used to proclaim the greatness of Samudra Gupta, the Gupta ruler. The Mughal Emperor Jahangir also used uh, uh, this pillar to make effective connections with the Indian past. Sometime during the Mughal period, this pillar was shifted from its original location to a central position in the Mughal fort at Allahabad. Jahangir had his lineage inscribed on the pillar in a magnificent uh, Nastalit Persian script. What was Jahangir's interpretation of that pillar? It represented a spectacular gesture from ancient times. Jahangir, by inscribing his genealogy on the pillar, was claiming a continuing authority. His statement was of appropriating and respecting that glory and becoming its inheritor. Mughal culture was in many ways a mixed culture. Ancestral strands from Central Asia merged with the inheritance from pre-Islamic India and was flavored with ideas from Persia of the second millennium AD. One of the more obvious ways in which cultures merged from the interface of those that came together at historical moments was in marriage alliances. In some cases, they grew from providing solutions to political problems. In others, they arose from a cultural coming together, often through religious forms. In some, they were the genuine expression of an attraction. Mughal royalty socialized with upper caste Hindus where such Hindus allowed this. We have to keep in mind 
that Hindus of status referred to those who lacked varna, caste identities, as the Mlech. An inscription from Palam, Mlech meaning someone who's outside caste and therefore a low in status. An inscription from Palam near Delhi dating to the 13th century, issued by a Hindu trader, refers to Muhammad bin Tughlaq as almost an ideal king. However, at one place, he does refer to him as a Mlech. No trader would have used this term for a sultan in any derogatory or abusive sense. That would have been the end of the trader. It could only refer to his having no caste identity, as was often what it meant. Non-Hindus of high status and low caste Hindus, as well as those that had no caste identity, the Avarnas as they were called, and including those regarded as untouchable and polluting, were all categorized as lich. Upper caste Hindus treated the Avarna and the untouchables with such contempt and worse that it can only be called victimization. Sadly, it was so deeply embedded in caste society since early times that such groups, even on conversion to Islam and Christianity and Sikhism, continued to be victimized in their new religions. This is evident from the continuing categories through history of Muslim Pasmandas, Sikh Mazhabis, Christian Churas, etc. This was despite these religions, Islam and Christianity and Sikhism, proclaiming their belief in the equality of all human beings. Intermarriage was viewed as at high status levels as a means of easing political relations and winning allies among various royal families. The Mughals married into Rajput families of high status, such as the Kachwaha Rajputs. There seems to have been no objection to such intermarriage. This is a bit strange because knowing how particular people were about kinship relations. They were obviously keen on the alliances and the political power that such marriages brought. Both Akbar and Jahangir had Rajput wives, as did some other of their Turushka noblemen. Turushka being the Sanskrit word for Turkish, consistently used in these sources. There was, of course, no love jihad in those days. Mughal court paintings in the royal ateliers show that many facets of the culture brought by the Hindu wives was frequently practiced. It seems to have been assimilated. Depicting an altogether different upper caste social group, there is an unusual document of the early 17th century that provides us with a perspective on the life and thoughts of a respected merchant and his community. This is the Ardha Kathanak, a lengthy autobiographical composition written in Brajbhasha Hindi by a merchant. Banarsi Das in the early 17th century was the merchant. It presents a view of Mughal times from a less exalted people than those who wrote the Persian and Sanskrit royal chronicles and biographies. The perspective is from the Jain merchant community living in Agra and Varanasi with extensive trading networks across towns where commerce was dominant. Jaipur, we are told, had 52 highly active markets. Problems with certain Mughal officers who tried to extort money from the rich merchants are mentioned, but obviously this was manageable because this is said in passing and the income of the merchants did not diminish thereby. The way of life continued to be a wealthy one. There is a detailed account in this text, the Arthakathana, of religious practices mentioning 
the subjects discuss the places of pilgrimage, the rituals and the ratas, the fasts that they kept, the deities they worshipped, such as Lakshmi, and the centrality of caste in their lives. Surprisingly, there is little mention of Islam, nor, for that matter, much of the bhakti sects and teachers that were important to northern India at this time. Remember, this is an upper caste text. Prominence is given to the Jains and the Shaiva, perhaps because Banarsi Das himself was interested in both, although he remained primarily a Jain. This raises a historical problem of the neglect of texts such as these in non-Persian languages that were not given the importance due to them as sources by modern historians. They were ignored by colonial historians as they did not suit the theories of colonial history, but even subsequent Indian medieval historians confined their sources largely to Persian official texts. Even the Sanskrit texts of this period, of which there were many, have not been consulted in as much detail as they should have been. The other crucial historical sources that were barely consulted were the multitude of inscriptions issued by a variety of social groups. These include some that are official documents, but many also refer to other activities of a broader social life. For example, there are a few inscriptions in poor quality Sanskrit embedded on the inner side of the walls of the Kutub Minar in Delhi. These record the repairs that were carried out by masons to the Kutub Minar after it was struck by lightning in around the 14th century. The repairs were at the orders of the Sultan, whose name is mentioned. They record the informal Hindu names of the Masons, and they conclude with an invocation to Vishwakarma, the deity worshipped by Hindu craftsmen. Being able to embed such records in a Sultanate building, a building of great importance, suggests their connection with the construction of the building. And invoking the deity makes it clear that this was not forced labor. Such inscriptions are not unique to the Qutub Minar as they are also found on occasion inside other buildings, a few of which were mosques. The question we have to ask is whether all this activity on the part of Hindus is indicative of their having been victimized in the period of, Mus of Muslim rule, and thereby having suffered a thousand years of slavery. It is a statement that is constantly made by the Indian middle class in both public and private life, and by many politicians. Those who are educated should know better. Studying the past means explaining the past, through a logical and rational explanation. Wherever there are controversies, there the attempt should be to understand why they have arisen and to inquire into them using proven reliable evidence and refraining from spreading hearsay as fact. In a roundabout way, I am asking for a better quality of history to be taught to our children and grandchildren in schools. Such a history refers to what is said in the texts, explores sources that provide further evidence and directs us to asking new questions. I'm not arguing that relations between communities identifying themselves by religion over the last 2000 years have been entirely amicable. Occasional inscriptions of defeated Hindu kings accuse their Mlecha enemies of what they refer to as the most despicable crimes, such as killing cows and Brahmins. We have to concede that wherever there are communities observing different religions, belief systems, ways of worship, 
there are bound to be confrontations, irrespective of who they are. This is inevitable since every religion maintains that it knows the truth about life and afterlife. When a belief system claims that it has the sanction of a divinity, then how can a human defy that sanction except by defying divinity? However, religious antagonisms go back to well before Islamic times. The Buddhists and the Jains disagreed with Vedic Brahmanism in these matters. So the Brahmins dismissed them as Nastika, non-believers in deity. The grammarian Patanjali, writing in about the third century BC, compared the relations between the Brahmins and the Shramans, the Shramans were the Buddhists and the Jains, and the Arjivakas and so on, non-Brahmins, Compare the relations between the Brahmins and the Shramans as similar to those between the snake and the mongoose. This is a very telling use of description. From time to time, there were bitter and violent feuds. These we don't mention because the colonial scholars did not mention them. Bitter and violent feuds between Brahmins and Shramans. They only emphasize, the colonial historians only emphasize Hindu-Muslim conflict, and we continue with this colonial legacy. Nor do we discuss the social control of religion in every society. I'm not arguing that we should cover up the crimes committed by all and sundry in the past, not at all. We cannot pretend that the past was without blemishes, the golden ages of ancient times, which we have conjured up. Carry on. We have to look at the doings of those who preceded us and in as honest a manner that we can muster. This has its own problems. It is perhaps time to discontinue looking at religion as the sole solution to our social problems and look for more effective solutions. My plea would be to dispassionately study the past with both its negative and positive features. This is not with the intention of setting it right. The past has passed, it cannot be changed. However, we can understand it better if we insist on exploring it freely and with a sensitivity to comprehending it and not manipulating it. Only then will we comprehend the links between the past and the present and establish in more meaningful ways of using the past for the future. Only then will we recognize our history from their history and understand why they differ. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Thapar, for this, uh, this thought-provoking present presentation. And uh, it's a very opportune time because the, the, for the last I don't know, decade, many pop historians have come up and they're telling their own stories and history. And so it was a it was an eye opener. So I first I would request my friend and comrade uh, Ravi to say a few words, and then we will open it for discussion. Thank you, Subhash, and thank you, Romila ji, so much for accepting again our invitation. And it is it is really special for us. It's truly an event for us today. And what a great. Uh, lecture but you know who will be surprised you know um as subhash and bhargo uh, prepare to invite comments and questions from the audience and from the chat box let me just you know uh, put in um, uh, one or two questions i remember last time you reprimanded me for asking very long questions so i will try to be <laughs> try to be brief. Um, um, you know, one 
uh, worry, curiosity um, we all have is that when history is summoned by these uh, communal or um, what you say segregative nationalist forces, uh, that history is farthest from truth. Uh, it may be, it is true that the history recalled by um, better political forces, what you call, for example, integrative nationalist forces that may fall closer to what, um, closer to truth. But when we come to the political arena and history is deployed into the political arena, often the, the, the better history or the history summoned by the uh, integrative or enlightened ideologues um, is, is um, it is difficult for them to confront the uh, bad history summoned by the communal forces or the segregative nationalist forces. And I suspect this is related to the fact that the identities formed on the basis of religion or ethnicity and so on, they appear to be deeper or far thicker identities than the identities that is linked up with modern nation state, you know, the civic nationalism kind of identity. So that's a tough battle as we are witnessing here. Although in case of the subcontinent, anti-colonial struggle helped the integrative kind of nationalism in your words, um, but still um, the other bad forces had their day and it led to partition. And now the specter of uh, Hindu Rashtra uh, is, is, is haunting India. Uh, so my question is that if identities um, based on ethnicity or religion are deeper. And if these identities play a role in imagining a nation, then the ethnic versions or religious versions of nationalism will always have an upper hand in the mass political arena compared to the, the, the modern uh, enlightened integrative kind of nationalism. So, um, the question, I, do, I am I'm not very clear about the question, but the question is how, what role number one historian can play in that, professional historian who knows about the past better. Um, how, how, if history comes in the political arena, especially in the competitive uh, electoral arena where whatever fault lines for whatever reasons are there in the society, they get activated through electoral competition then what safeguards can we have? Um, will it always be the case that the thicker version of nationalisms um, based on ethnicity and religion and so on will have it easy with the masses and uh, the civic nationalisms, nationalisms tied to nation state that will always have tough time confronting these communal or religious nationalisms in the political arena, you know, so, Maybe I should stop here and see if, you know, if. Uh, I, yeah. I feel I should be giving another lecture in order to. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that one has to realize is that societies are not static. Therefore, history cannot be static. Therefore, one must recognize that the values that we give a lot of prominence to today, like, say, democracy, um, the position of women, did not have that prominence in other periods of time. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things about nationalism is that when you have uh, all-inclusive, what I call integrative nationalism, as we had in India with the anti-colonial nationalism and everybody's participating. The legitimacy that is required from the past is always to take the value of the contemporary back 
to the history of the past. Therefore, democracy is very important to um, our society today. I mean, you really can't talk about uh, development and so on without democracy. But please let remember, let's remember that democracy as an ideal, as a practicing ideal, comes to be put into, an attempt is made to put it into practice only in recent centuries. I mean, we may talk about the Greeks had democracy, but they didn't have democracy because two thirds of the people that lived in Athens were slaves. That's not a democratic system. Similarly with us, we didn't have any democracy in the ancient times. We had perhaps a little more representation in local councils and so on, but there were, because democracy is something we are concerned with in the present. And therefore we can only find it in modern times when our concerns with democracy become, uh, become important. So one of the things one has to always keep in mind is that when one's talking about identities, um, it's necessary for historians and people who read history to look, if you say that the identity was X, whatever it may be, you have to look at all the sources, the sources from every social group, from different aspects, to see whether in fact they all identify with that identity or not. And very often you find that they don't. I mean, for example, um, we talk about the Muslims and a, as a unified single community, and everybody who has any touch of Islam is immediately called a Muslim. This is this is a very recent thing. In the old days, they were known by their ethnic names or by the area that they came from, and so on. They were called Yavanas, Turushkas, Tajiks. So very seldom are they referred to as Muslim. So. The question really is that, are you going to allow historians to freely investigate these identities and tell us when the identities became important, how they arose, what they meant in those times, do they mean the same thing today? They may not, they may, may mean something quite different. Um, the, the term Yavana is used for the Greeks when they come, um, it's used for the Arabs. It's used for Queen Victoria. Now, the point is that they're not all the same people. They're different people. And you have to redefine the term as you go through history from century to century. And it is redefined in the text. So it's a much more complex thing than simply saying, oh, the Yavanas was the term used for the Arabs and all. Yavanas behaved in the same way. Not at all. There are many differences. And this is one of the, the major problems with historical writing today, because the good historian is aware of these differences, nuances, and ways in which words are used, names are used, labels are given. For the person who is either not a historian or a very poor historian, they're all one. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. So that when you say they're all one, you're you're giving, um, you're making them all behave in a way and have the same value systems as everybody of that community, and you assume that everybody of that community has the same value system. Now, if you, for example, with many Sufis um, who were opposed to Orthodox Islam. If you say all Sufis are Muslims, you're making a misjudgment because all Sufis were not Muslims. There were some who were very distant from the Muslims. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that it's time that we grow up and look at history in terms of the period and time and the source from which the evidence is coming. We can't go on making these brash sweeping statements about this community and that community and this culture and that culture and so on. We have to take history with some sensitivity, sensitivity and some seriousness. And this will not happen as long as history is used for political purposes as it is being used today. 
Now, you're not going to get a change of thinking by simply saying you're using it for political purposes and stop doing that. They won't stop doing that. You have to then question the person who is using history only for a political purpose. I'm not saying that history has never been used for a political purpose. It has in the past. It's a question of degree. Up to a minor point, it was used fairly often in the past, but the degree to which history is being dragged in by its neck and being made into a political force today, this has never happened before. And with this, one has to then stand up as a historian and say, I'm sorry, but this doesn't go with the facts as I know them. And so there should be a debate between people. It's not that, you know, one group gets up and abuses the other group and thinks because it has political power, it can say what it likes. That's not the way to go about it. You have to have considered debates between people who know the sources that they are referring to. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Thank you, Bob. One, one I'd like to clarify, we keep talking about um, history being the truth about the past. History is not the truth. History has never claimed to be the truth about the past. History is the understanding of the past. And therefore, as you have discovering more and more sources and you discover more and ask more and more questions, you may have to change your views about the past, provided you have reliable evidence to support the changes that you're suggesting. I mean, if I can give you one example, it's very interesting that the Vedic period, for example, in the 18th century when Max Muller is doing his studies and various other people, Indian and foreign scholars, the only thing that you needed to know was what are the Vedic texts telling you? So if you can read the Vedas, you're okay, you're a scholar. Then come other kinds of sources of information which are different. Archaeology, the Harappan culture comes up in the 1920s and people say, how does this relate to the Aryan culture of the Vedas? It's a debate which is still going on. In the 1950s, linguistics comes up and you have all kinds of new ideas about the meaning of phrases, sentences, words in the Vedic texts and where they come from, what their origins are and recourse to you know, bringing in new languages and suggesting that there were people who were living very close together, speaking two different languages. Today, you have genetics. You have the DNA results coming up saying there was a strand from Iran, there was a strand from Central Asia, and so on. So the point that I'm trying to make is that as your sources get wider and expand, you have access to more information. As you read more, understand more, and get more and more interested in methodology, the questions you ask are different. The questions that we ask of our Vedic sources today are not limited to the questions that Max Müller asked. We ask many more questions. Therefore, it's not the, that historians are running after the truth, whatever the truth may be. Historians are running after trying to explain with the evidence that they have what happened in the past and to understand the past. Thank you, Professor Thapar. I will ask uh, Comrade Bhargav to uh, share some question in the chat box. Comrade Bhargav, please. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Professor Thapar. Uh, there are certain questions. Uh, one question I'm taking from the chat box uh, a question posed by on Mr. Ravana Kumar. Sorry. Well, this question posed by uh, Ravana Kumar. Question mm -hmm. follows as follows. I understand the picture that the colonial historians have tried to present, especially in the context of religious nationalism. But how does the work of academics translate into public consciousness? We have be, we have seen the kinds of hatred and conflict between the Hindu and Muslim community, especially during and after the partition. And the current political discourse is just taking advantage of the underlying hatred that was already there within the community. 
Well, this is precisely why it's necessary to look much more carefully and understand much more deeply what happened in the in the last millennium. It is because what I've been arguing is that because of the erroneous understanding of the Indian past by colonial writers, having an influence on Indian writers as well, that we are in a situation where we automatically um, become violent against a particular community. Now, I'm not saying that violence between communities did not exist in the past. Of course it existed. And that is what I was trying to explain by the quotation from Patanjali, that they're treating each other as snakes, as the snake and the mongoose. So it's quite clear. The point is, what do we understand of the nature of that violence? What kind of violence was it? What degree did it happen? On? And how much of that actually came to play a role in the violence of today. What today brought brings about this very extreme violence? It was not the Brahmins and the Shamans, although they were violent towards each other, but there are other factors and we have to be aware of these other factors much more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Please, Margo, please. Uh, yeah. There is another question uh, from V. Sridhar. Isn't it true that elements of segregative stream of nationalism had infiltrated into the integrative stream in India since the national movement began? Although the latter was substantially sidelined after independence, the mainstream also accommodated the segregated nationalism stream. Has this not compromised the progressive stand in strand in Indian nationalism and allowed communalism to gain an upper hand over time. I I would say that this is this is not uh, the reason for communalism. Communalism having an upper hand, but it is certainly true that we have to look again at the components of integrated nationalism and see. You, I mean. No movement is purely this and purely that. There are always elements of bits and pieces in each formation that the movement has. And what we have to see is how integrated was what we call anti-colonial nationalism. And was it different from what I call segregated nationalism, which is religious nationalism or ethnic nationalism so on. You have to see the degree and you have to see the issues on which there is a difference. I mean, my whole intention in, in this talk is to talk about how complex historical explanations are. You cannot give one explanation and say it applies to everything. Was it true that uh, the only reason why there were elements of um, uh, almost Hindutva, not quite, but some degree of Hindutva thinking in the Indian National Congress in the early years. Why? What happened? Why, well, why did these elements come in? Was it an understanding of what Indian culture is about? And if so, what did this, where did this understanding come from? If you accept the two-nation theory, then you have no problem with the fact that Indian culture pre-Islamic was purely Hindu and everybody <clears throat> was Hindu. <clears throat> One has to ask the question that was this really the case? What was it that, that um, was projected at that time? And uh, this is where you have to have an open mind uh, if you're doing historical research. You can't come to history with a mind that says, I'm going to prove that this was the case. You have to have an open mind and, you know, examine, pull apart and take uh, different points of view, different articulations together and see what results. Uh, thank you. Bar oh, yeah, Bar please raise your question because... Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Tafat. There is a question from Anil Sadhgopalji. What was the status of Adivasis during Vedic period? Who occupied, who occupied the fertile lands first? Adivasis or the upper caste engaged in writing Vedas? 
how and why adivasis were primarily settled in forests not in the fertile land now the answer to that question depends on a rather lengthy study of who were the owners of the land and who were the cultivators of the land which land was owned by whom which land was cultivated by whom you know you can't do these broad generalizations and say the ownership was all upper caste hindus because it not necessarily always was sometimes there are differences um then who cultivates the land it's a different caste that cultivates the land what is the relationship between those who own the land and who cultivate the land this is a very very important crucial question uh, which historians are looking at now which uh, hadn't been considered earlier so the the point is that you know there are no simple answers to these kinds of questions um there there is plenty of scope for looking much more closely at the sources and trying to understand what they're trying to say and that's really it's beginning to be done by historians now that is a big change and this change of course is objected to by those who have firm ideas of it was always this and if it was always this then all these kinds of investigations are not taken very well therefore you have an attempt to try and clamp down on history and say forget about this history only learn this history only look at this only do this make it more and more restrictive so that these general broader questions which are crucial to our understanding of the past cannot be asked i mean <clears throat> this is one complaint that i have against what is happening to educational policy today they are not only hacking away large chunks of history leaving students with the strange question of well if this happened in 1200 ad you are now taking us to 1600 ad what happened in between somebody has to answer that question you can't take a leap of two centuries and say this is this is history continues because a lot of changes took place in me so it's a question of the attitude you have towards history are you treating history entirely as a political weapon which you bring into your armory and you use and shoot as a gun or are you using the possibility of looking at history to understand what your society was about what were the big issues in society we today may think that a particular identity was a very big identity and then when you look at the sources you find no reference to it so then you begin to understand that it was not such a big identity in those days and i'm back to what i said at the beginning that there is a time difference between one period and another, another period in terms of how um how uh, the pattern of culture is established thank you professor thapan i want to relay a question from jinnia sen gupta you said that history is into the truth but an understanding of the truth which makes me wonder in a post truth an understanding of the truth an understanding of the past understanding of the past yeah but she wrote like that which makes me wonder in a post truth false facts there are where the two ends of the political spectrum cannot even agree on the validity of the facts they base their arguments which, on which we go about understanding the truth or indeed advocating for justice and equity no, sorry i didn't follow um, which makes me wonder what does he say after that uh, wonder in a post to truth false facts era in, in sorry in a post what post to truth era in quote okay. quote in quote post to truth quote in quote false facts era where two ends of the political spectrum cannot even agree on the validity of the facts they base their arguments on how should one go about understanding the truth or indeed advocating for justice and equity it depends on whether your concern is with understanding the truth i don't know um or trying to understand the past 
what happened, why it happened, how it happened, etc., 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 in an effort to perhaps be able to say, I think that this is what probably happened, and this is the results that came out of it, which may or may not agree with the present day understanding of that past. You know, truth is a very difficult concept in the sense that you have to be very, very clear about what you mean by the truth. Your truth and my truth may be quite different. What happens then? Are you and I going to argue and convince, one convinces the other that the person who's arguing has a truth which is true? Or do you say, well, these are two kinds of arguments and explanations that can be made, and you choose the one that you think is, is the more appropriate? Which is why today in education, the one thing that is missing is students asking questions as and when they feel like it, and students being given a large range of answers and being told this is the reason for this, this is the reason for this, this is the reason for this, and discussing with the students. I mean, I, I am appalled at this turn to examination grades. 296, all right, you're in 290, 284, you're not. This is nonsense. This is not education. This is something dreadful that you're really killing the mind of the child. You must train the child to ask questions and you must train the child to understand that debate and discussion is absolutely necessary to sorting out the kinds of problems that we have. Absolutely fundamentally necessary. And this is the one thing that is being systematically destroyed by the kinds of educational policies that we're adopting. Ranjana M has raised her hand. Uh, Ranjana, please. Ranjana, please uh, share your question. Unmute yourself and share your question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Thapar, for this very enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, actually, I want to just uh, reiterate, uh, you know, further uh, a question that was, has already been raised by Rona Kumar, that how can one uh, really translate the history of the past and the investigation and the inquiry of the past into public consciousness today, given the fact that history has, be, has been so much manipulated, distorted, uh, and being rewritten with un, untruths. I know that Professor Thapar, you don't like to use the word truth, but with so much of distortion, how does one translate this into public consciousness? Because can we, can we continue to let it remain within the realm of academia? How does one get break that barrier to come out in a bigger, in a larger way into public consciousness? Thank you. Well, I think there are two agencies which can be started off with right away. Um, and then others will come along. One is, as I mentioned, education, that if you, if you teach a child to ask questions, to seek information, to seek broader knowledge, and put things together in terms of, does this help us to understand that, and that kind of thing, um, that would be one agency. The second is, um, I don't know how one does this, but you know, something has to be done about media in this country both public media um, and social media. The amount of utter rubbish that gets projected as supposedly new knowledge is just incredible. I mean, I think back of the concerns that the older generations had with what is being broadcast on the radio the talks that are being given, what is being said in public speeches, etc. There was a consciousness of being careful not to make wild statements. But that consciousness is gone. People get up and say just what they like and go on 
thump thumping and saying, I'm, I'm correct. I know what I'm saying. I'm correct. This actually did happen. Therefore, the outcome of that happening, being what is happening today, is perfectly justified. I mean, this question of justifying nonsense by more wicked means is something that really needs to be discussed much more. I mean, I, I'm, I'm perfectly willing that uh, people may think that the, what the media is projecting, most of the media is projecting, is not nonsense. But discuss it then. Talk about it and explain why you think it's not nonsense. And let someone else explain why they think it is nonsense, if they agree that it is nonsense. I mean, whatever they may decide to, to, to do. But, you know, th the point is that you cannot have a system which you call a free system if there's constant constraint on what you can talk about and how you want to talk about it and what con conclusions you come to, where you put those conclusions and so on. That's not freedom of thought. That's not freedom of thought in the sense of having an open mind to understanding a problem, whatever it may be, the past, the present, anything of that. The whole question of understanding is fundamental. And it's not understanding in terms of, as I said, objective questions and grades and that kind of thing. It's understanding the working of what it is that you are trying to project. And unless we do that, then the present situation will go on. I am seriously concerned. I mean, I will die very soon because I'm of a, in that age group that won't last too long. Um, but I'm seriously concerned about the children in school today, when they grow up, they'll know nothing. They'll know absolutely nothing worthwhile. And they won't know how to get to things worthwhile. There'll be a few who have very superior education somewhere who might then become the bosses and control and so on. Otherwise, I mean, you, you listen to the public sort of speeches and talks and things that are given today. And you hold your head and say, can't people read at least before they get up and make a talk, or give a speech or whatever it may be? Just read a little bit on the subject so that they're slightly knowledgeable. But to just get up and talk on the basis of knowing nothing. But my voice has to be heard because I have a voice. Well, all right, if that's the kind of society you want, you're welcome to it. But it's not the kind of society that, you know, we grew up in, we wanted, we wanted, we were concerned about keeping and keeping going and so on. Uh, <clears throat> we have with us uh, Professor Dolores. I will request her to share her query or comment. Professor Dolores. Yeah, please. And uh, yourself, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh my God. Uh, well, I, I don't think I have any, anything more to add. I completely agree with everything that Professor Thapar has said, and also join in this uh, moment in a way of utter despair for us who are progressive, who are teachers. Um, you know, over the years, I've I've done my best to sort of move away from this religious identification of history, and even today, just on. On Monday, um, in, in my class here, I, I live in Montreal, uh, some young students of South Asian origin, because there were celebrations in the diaspora, consecration of Ram Mandir. And they were quite concerned because they're hearing something contested by me in the class. And they come and they say, you know, like we are from Telangana. My grandfather said we were oppressed by the British and by the Muslims, and now is our time. And, you know, we're hearing something different. And I'm, I'm so happy that I have a chance to talk to these young people and that they're open enough. But there is this pervasive veil of not wanting to hear something that goes against the, you know, uh, the the current current reality, and it's implicated with lack of knowledge, the education system, but also the force and the power of sort of being part of the status quo, and. I'm sorry, I don't have a more hopeful message, but it's still so important to 
to hear what Professor Tapper has to say because we know uh, we put so much, um, uh, you know, we put so much on on your words and your background, and it really helps us in our work because we support it. We echo you, but the, your your stature helps us to get in, uh, more credibility. So just thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Ashtami Rajan, Ashtami Rajan, please uh, unmute yourself and share your question. Sorry. Hello, Professor Thapa. Please. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been working in the field of education for young kids for a long time now, and I wanted to understand how you, what would be your, uh, you know, kind of thinking on teacher education considering the kind of policy documents that are coming in, how do teacher education institutes approach this teaching of history in the context of uh, policies that are coming in, which are saying that history is just one truth, which is which it is not. So in that context, what kind of efforts do the teacher education institutes need to make, especially for uh, you know teachers who are going to teach young students in schools? Well, I think um, what I said earlier about <clears throat> the approach to history and the need to get students to be um, familiar with the idea of asking questions and discussion and debate would apply to any subject. It, it would apply right through to, to any kind of uh, discipline that one, one takes up, um, which is why I think that the fundamentals of education need to be rethought. Unfortunately, um, there's such excitement over the technology that has changed with computers and this and that and the other. They're, they're, they're changing the, 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 the mechanism of thinking, as it were. Um, but when you start talking about you know, the data that you're giving and how to analyze the data, then there's a kind of falling away, falling back and saying, no, no, what we have is all right. We'll carry on with this and we'll just go on improving our technology. Now, you cannot improve your technology before a certain point unless you have a wider, bigger type of data, unless you have ways of examining that data new ways of examining that data. I mean, that is, after all, what the history of technology is based on. You you move from a simple um, knife to a spear, to a sword, to a gun, and that kind of thing. And it's it's uh, the function of, of what you're learning, the function of what you're learning, how you're using it, why you want to use it that way, are there other ways of using it, and so on. These are all questions that should be asked in an educational syllabus. And I did, ex when, I, when I was briefly for two years on Prasar Bharati, I did suggest that we have an education channel only for education. And my idea was that in the morning, you had qualified people teaching the students. You pick up the textbook that the student is using and you go through it sentence by sentence saying, this is what it means, this is what it should say, this is what is now being taught, etc., etc. And in the afternoon, you address the, uh, the college, the, the school teachers and say, you know, these are the books that you should be reading because the subject is being treated in this way and that way and so on. Um, but when you suggest these kinds of things, you have to have an authority that is receptive to your new suggestions and receptive to the idea of discussion. Today, that is absent. And today, all that matters is that somebody says, this is how you explain X. And all the teachers are told, this is how you explain X. And they will go on explaining it that way. That doesn't help anybody certainly doesn't help education. Professor Rama Melkote is here. Please, uh, Madam, please raise your question. Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. You are not audible. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no, you are not audible. Yeah, yeah, Tindra, please, can you please help? Uh... Yes, yeah. I am. Please, please, please go ahead. Yeah. 
thank you so much for not not audible please please be loud please hear? yeah yeah please please can you hear me yeah yes. yeah 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 we, we can hear you please no thank you so much for organizing this and it's always so enlightening to listen to the professor uh, i my question is about uh, you know the whole question of education and identity formation uh, in a country where the you know the most serious divide, in my view, is the literate and uh, those who are illiterate are now being fed on uh, by the media. Their education is really through the media, what they see, the visual media, what they see, etc. And now with the textbooks being ta tampered the way they are, the so-called educated, those who are literate, are also being fed on those kind of lies. Now, how do we deal with this when identities are formed by, uh, you know, on the basis of what they see, what they um, not read and uh, critically understand, but just see and, you know, the it's, it's very hard to look at the way things are going in, say, for example, rural areas. When I go back to my village, I find that many many children are always you know being fed on this and they think that their identity is what the media um, gives them you know media and also the politics the political leaders etc so how does and your suggestion that we should have an education channel is really wonderful but will it be allowed ever is the question so this question of literacy bothers me uh, really something very uh, should be taken seriously but I, I do understand that even those who are literate college going students are also now you know uh, into this kind of uh, the, they are also fed on this and I don't know how much of influence that has on their identity formation etc. I don't think you know earlier one thought of when I was in college, I never thought of myself as a Hindu or a Muslim or anything. But now you're forced to, whether I like it or not, that Hindu identity is forced on me. So this is a very complex thing. And if we can, uh, your suggestion that we should have an education channel seems to be brilliant. Whether, whether it will be allowed is a question. No, you know. You know it, it, I have just one more thing. The question of class. Somehow we need to deal with the question of class when you're talking about community, caste, etc. Et There's so many divisions in that. Okay. No, I, I, I was going to say that education is very fundamentally important, provided it's not a question of literacy. Anyone can be literate. It's what you teach the child along with literacy. It's that which is very important. And I'm not saying that you, you teach the child that this is the truth and this is not true. But you teach the child how one examines a, a problem uh, in order to discover what might be a little closer to what actually is happening or less, whatever it may be. So that the emphasis is not on this is your identity, therefore this is what you have to know. The question is on why do you need an identity? I mean, we never teach our children that. Why do you need to say that I am a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or whatever? Why do I need, to, why does a child need to say that I am of this caste or that caste or whatever? That basic fundamental question of how you acquire an identity and what it means is important and has to be taught to children if you're going to get them to question this. Otherwise, it's a case of why the hell should they question it? They're told that this is their identity. They're fine. They're living with that identity. But this business of questioning is absolutely fundamental, I think. Yeah. So, uh, Shekhar, Sh 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 please. They... Shekhar Ramakrishnan Ramakrishna is with us. I would request him to share his query. Yeah, uh, Professor Thapar, thank you so much for this uh, really 
you know, great talk going into so much detail about how these various relations have been actually in the past. So the thing that I was uh, requesting, especially the organizers, uh, you know, uh, and following up on the last question, I think it will be very, very useful to have a good web resource where mm. people could go and say, what is this I'm told? What is the truth behind it? What are the sources, you know, uh, and so on. I think it will be very useful. I mean, it happened to me personally. Uh, I'm sorry for the distraction. I grew up with a certain image of Subhash Bose in Tamil Nadu. And uh, as a very good guy, who just went wrong, you know, joining the Japanese. I, did, I knew nothing about his fascist sympathies or, uh, you know, time in Germany and so on until I went to Wikipedia a couple of days ago and read about that period. And so that turned out to be an extremely useful, you know, resource for me and uh, with multiple references and everything, but it was all in one place. And I feel that something like that, you know, that can uh, you know, include the material that you talked about today and so on would be very, very valuable. Yeah, one would, like to, one would like to include that kind of material, not, not by saying that my material is more correct and yours is wrong or anything, but simply that, all right, we have a statement coming from people saying that the Hindus were victimized. <clears throat> what are the sources? What evidence can they produce? What evidence can I produce to say that, no, perhaps they were not victimized in that way? They were simply sat upon like all you know, um, the upper levels of society always sit on the lower levels of society kind of thing. Um, it's it's that feeling that, you know, you you have the power to question what is being told to you, which is very important, and see if you can find an alternative answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Thapat. Listening to you was always an uh, exciting thing, very inspiring also. And thank you very much again for a thought-provoking presentation. I thank all the participants also for uh, joining the debate. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>